<laughs> All right. So before we before we start talking about fluid pressure, I want to go back a little bit to center mass and centroids, and and talk about a little kind of extension, uh, the theorem of Pappus. Um, and before, and I, yeah, this shouldn't be, I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be not. Um, before we talk about the theorem of Pappus, I just wanted to, um, to mention why we, why we would want to calculate a center, center of mass or a centroid. Um, the one, one reason, it kind of, kind of based on our, based on our assumptions that, that we used in the problem, is that, um, for simple shapes, we can um, often, if we're trying to analyze how they move, that kind of thing, we assume that their mass is concentrated at the center of mass. So if you have some kind of odd shaped thing flying, you toss it through the air and you want to analyze how it moves, you can assume for a lot of things that its mass is concentrated at the center of mass. So you don't have to worry about this complicated shape, you just worry about the mass at the center of mass. Um, if, you, if you toss things up in the air and they rotate, they're going to rotate about an axis that goes through the center of mass. So that's, that's one, of the, one of the reasons, or a couple of the reasons that we, want, that we would want to find the center of mass because it helps simplify physical problems. Um, so the theorem of Pappus is kind of, kind of related to that. So we have some region in the plane. So here's my region. So there's region R in a plane. And we have a line in the plane that doesn't intersect our region. Well, there's my line. And we'll call this line L. And for the theorem of Pappus, line L doesn't intersect R. It's outside of the, the region in the plane. Um, and we're going to say that this point here is the centroid or the center of mass of R. And I'm not sure if I said before, we kind of use the word centroid and center of mass interchangeably. Centroid, usually when we talk about centroid, it's a property of the object, the shape of the object. And that's wi when your density is uniform. If the density is not uniform, then the center of mass and the centroid might not be the same, might not be the same thing. So center of mass is usually a property of the shape and the material together. So that's, that's for the most part, we use them kind of interchangeably. All right, so we have this region R in the plane, this line L, not intersecting, center of mass of the region. And we're going to call this distance, I'll do that in red, from the center of mass to the line, we're going to call that R, small r. So we know the distance from, from the center of mass of this region to the line. Um, theorem Pappas tells us, it's a pretty cool thing, the volume of the solid of revolution generated by rotating R around L I'm not going to write that all out, but we're, we're rotating our, the region about line L, and this is our radius. The volume of the center of revolution is 2 pi R times A, where A is the region, the area of R.
So that's what the theorem of Pappus tells us. So if we know that area of this region and we can find the centroid, we can find the volume of revolution using the theorem of Pappus. And if we we know how to we know how to find volumes volumes of revolution, we can verify the, the theorem of Pappus by finding the volume of revolution and then finding the centroid and using the theorem of Pappus and showing that those two things are the same thing. <coughs> so I like to think of the theorem of Pappus as considering all the area of that region concentrated at the center of mass when we rotate it around the, the axis. So, so in, a, in a lot of cases we, consider, we think about the mass being concentrated at the center of mass. The theorem of Pappus tells us we can kind of think about the area concentrated at the center of mass and just rotate that around the axis. So that's what the theorem of Pappus tells us. So if we have some complicated complicated region, we can find the volume. Yes? Um, it will not be tested directly. I'll put it that way. <coughs> um, so it's a nice, it's a nice little thing, nice little thing to know. And I, I remember once, years back, there was a test that we did in. We were talking in th about three-dimensional geometry, something or other. And there was a question that came up, and the guy on the test, one of my students, remembered the theorem of Pappus from first semester and found this, the volume, this complicated volume, rather than doing these complicated integrals, he used the theorem of Pappus and saved himself a lot of work on the test. And I was pretty impressed with that. So anyway, that's, a, that's just a little extra having to do with the centroid of a, of a uh, plane region. All right, now we're ready to talk about uh, fluid pressure and fluid force. Very similar idea to what we've just been talking about with, with, uh, with work and with um, centroids. Same, same kind of process. So for, for fluid pressure, we're using, um, we're going to use something called uh, called Pascal's principle. And Pascal's principle tells us tells us about the pressure that's exerted by a exerted by a liquid. So fluid pressure exerted on an object at a depth h is the weight of the liquid, or the weight density of the liquid, times H. So P is pressure. H equals the depth of the liquid. And W is the weight density. And by weight density, we mean uh, uh, weight per unit volume. So this is the pressure that's exerted on a um, on an object under water. Basically, it's the weight the weight of the water times your distance distance below the water. And Pascal's principle says that the pressure exerted by a fluid depends only on the depth and is transmitted equally in all directions. So that's that's what we're that's the assumption that we're that we're using is is that the pressure depends only on the depth and it's exerted equally in all directions. So this is our pressure. The force, or sorry, pressure is. Um, force per unit area, so the force exerted by the liquid is going to be the pressure times the area at depth H.
So if we want to know the force that the, that the fluid is exerting on, a, on an object, we need to know the area at a particular depth, and that will tell us the <coughs> force that's exerted at that depth. And for all of these, all of these things, we're, we're saying that the depth H is positive. So that's going to be an important one to remember. We're going below the surface of the water, but we're defining the depth. We're defining the depth to be positive. So the pressure just depends on how far we are below the surface. The force that's exerted on, on an object is the pressure at that depth times the area of the object that's at that depth. So if we have something that's submerged vertically in liquid, like a window pane in a window well full of water, the depth varies. So the, pre the force is going to vary with the depth, and we have to, to get the total force, we have to add up all the little pieces of force that that liquid is exer exerting on our, on our surface. If the area changes along with the depth, then we have to figure out how the area changes along with the depth to get the total force. So that's, why, that's, where, we're, that's where we're at talking about um, talking about force and pressure. So we're, again, an application of integration. So, let's draw a picture of our vertically, our vertical surface that's submerged in water. And we'll come up with, uh, with a, an expression for how we're going to find the total force on a vertical surface submerged in a liquid. So here's the surface surface of our liquid, it's a nice flat plane, and here's our vertical our vertical surface. It's not waving back and forth, these are just the sides so that it varies in cross-section. So I'm going to put the for this particular problem, I'm going to put the y-axis going positive, and I'm going to put the x-axis at the surface of the water. And I'm going to divide this surface into little rectangles. Should be familiar by now, we're dividing this into little rectangles. The total force that's exerted on this surface by the liquid that it's submerged in is going to be the sum of the forces uh, on all the different rectangles <coughs> added up. We're going to add up this, the force on the rectangles. At the base of the <coughs> at the base of our surface, it's vertical in the water. We're going to say that y equals a. And at the top of our surface here. Our, our object, you say y equals b. The thickness, we're going to divide the thick, this rectangle into little thicknesses, delta y. And the distance of this small rectangle below the surface of the water is some function, I'm going to call it h of y. So we want to express the depth in terms of y. So what we're going to do here, just like we've done before, is we're going to divide the, the interval from a to b into small subintervals, and we're going to find the force on, on each subinterval, and then we're going to sum the forces over all those sum intervals, uh, all those little little intervals. So I'm going to say that delta F sub I, the small amount of force on this one rectangle, is the weight density of the water times the depth, that's what we said before, times the area of the little rectangle. 
and I guess I should say depth sub i and area sub i. The area of that little piece. So we can substitute some things in here. The weight density of the, of the liquid times our depth is just h at y sub i times we'll call this distance L sub y. We need to express everything in terms of y. So this is the length of the this little rectangle, L sub y. So we're going to say L at y sub i because the length might vary as y varies. And the area, the rest of the area is delta x, delta y sub i. And then the total force is going to be the sum of all these little pieces. however many pieces we've divided it into uh, delta F sub I. So we're adding all these little pieces. And what does this sum suggest now? If we, if we make delta Y smaller and smaller and smaller, then we can write it as an integral. So we're setting up an integral with respect to Y to find the total force on, on this vertical surface submerged in a liquid. So the force I'm going to write this as an integral and we get to set up a lot of nice integrals. So we're going to say that uh, the fluid W equals the weight density and we're assuming that the weight density doesn't vary with respect to y. We, we could put that in there, for, but for these problems, our weight density is constant. Um, and our, our surface is submerged vertically in a liquid between y equals a and y equals b. So the force is going to be the integral from A to B of H as a function of Y. So our, our height varies as we move along the, along the surface times L sub Y because our length <coughs> can vary as we move up the surface times dy. And again, we say h sub y equals the depth at y. And L sub y is the horizontal length. And again, H sub Y is positive. Oh, did I forget my W? Thank you. And on the, pro the, the book gives you, gives some standard weight densities of water. I can't remember, it's like 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. <laughs> Um, anytime you need one of those, I would give it to you. If I didn't give it to you for, for some reason, you could just say, assume that W equals 1. And, and if you carry through your calculations that way, you're going to be fine. So again, finding fluid force, finding the force on this vertically submerged surface is really it's an exercise in setting up, setting up and evaluating integrals translating a physical situation into, into an integral that we can then evaluate. 
So what, all I want to do, this this is our idea. We're just adding up the the force on each little each individual little rectangle as we move up the surface. So what I want to do is just do a couple of examples of setting up and evaluating these these integrals. And depending on the depending on the situation, we get we get interesting integrals. So let me see, which one do I want to do here? Let's do the trapezoid. Okay. So we have a vertical, a vertical dam gate. So, and our dam gate is in a canal, it, and it's in the shape of an isosceles trapezoid. And we have some dimensions of this dam gate. It's eight feet across the top. It is six feet at the bottom, six <coughs> feet across at the bottom. And its height is five feet. Um, and the top of the gate is four feet below the surface of the water. So what do we know right away about this situation? What do we know about the dam and the gate? If its surface, if the top of it's four feet below the water, it's not doing a very good job. There's four feet of water flowing over the dam. So we know that already. Um, all right, we want to find the fluid force. We want to find the force that the water is exerting on the gate. So what are we going to do here? That's always a good start. Let's draw a picture. Let's draw a picture. All right. And on these kinds of problems, we can set up our we can set up our axes however we want. We want to set up our, our coordinate system in a way that helps us out. So here's my here's my isosceles trapezoid. Um, we have it eight feet across here. There's the sides. Um, so we know it's eight feet across here. We know it's six feet across here. <coughs> and we know that it is um, five feet high. So there's a start. We know the water is up here, four feet above the surface. So this is four feet. So I'm going to um, the way I the way I thought of this is I'm going to set my axes <coughs> so that. Uh, the origin is at the surface of the water. So I'm going to draw my axes like so. And this is going to be x, so this point is going to be 0, 0. This, that's just how I set it up for this problem. So my origin is at the surface of the water, and the, the y-axis goes through the center of the, the, center of the, of the dam. All right, so let's let's figure out the parts that we need to put, to put into our integrand. 
I need, um, I'm going to divide this into rectangles. I always like to draw my rectangles so I know what I'm talking about. So that little distance we could call it delta y or dy. And the distance below the surface is going to be h of y, some function of y. So for this, for this situation, what is h of y going to be? We want our depth to be positive. If we're, if this is a zero, zero, how far below the surface is this? Y units. But here, below the surface, y is negative. We want our depth to be positive. So h of y is going to be negative y. So as, for example here, let's say I'm seven feet below the surface of the water here. Y would be negative seven, but I want my depth to be positive. So h of y is going to be negative y. Um, now we need, to, we need to find L of y. We need to find this width. So L of y is the width of this rectangle. <coughs> and it varies as we move up, up the dam. So how are we going to find L of y? What do we need to do? Well, we're going to integrate eventually, but we need some expression for L of y to plug into my integral. Some a ratio, some somehow something that we can do with the to figure out how the width varies as y changes. So let's let's call the width here x, and we need to find a find an expression of x in terms of y. How can we do that? What are the sides of the trapezoid? What kind of shape? They're lines. Do we know something about the coordinates of the of these points? Based on our coordinate system. What would this what would the coordinate of this point be? Four <coughs> negative four. What would the coordinate of this point be? This is six feet wide, so it would be three. And how far below the surface are we? Negative, is it nine? Are we right? Four and five, yes, negative nine. All right, what can we do with those two points? We can find the equation of that line, right? We can find the slope. We can plug in one of these points. We can find the equation of that line. That will give us an expression of x in terms of y. We're going to find the equation of the, of the line forming this right-hand side. So what's our slope? What's the slope of the side? Five. Five? Um, so what's my equation going to be? Uh, let's use this point, y minus negative 9 equals 5 times x minus 3. So my equation is y equals 5x minus 24 when I rearrange this. And then I solve for x. x equals y plus 24 over 5. Now I have the width, the width of my little rectangle in terms of y. Now I can set up my integral. Um, so what is, so we found x, what is the width, what is L sub y going to be in terms of x? 2x. I have, I found, I found this, this half of it. So L sub y is going to be 2 fifths y plus 24. We have to express our entire integral in terms of y. Now we're ready to set up our integral. Very nice.
nice and easy now. So our force is going to be the weight density of water, whatever that is. What are the limits? What are my limits of integration? At the bottom of the dam, at the bottom of the canal, y is negative 9 to negative 4. Very good. I have my h sub y, negative y times my length, two-fifths y plus 24 times dy to get my area of my little rectangle. Oops, I forgot a parenthesis. There we go. And not a difficult integral to evaluate. I just end up with a, a y squared and a y. So when I evaluate this out, and we're going to say that for water, for this problem, uh, 62.4 pounds per cubic feet. So when I plug that all in, not a hard one to evaluate, I get that the force exerted on the side of the dam is 13936 pounds. So this dam that's eight feet wide and five feet tall in the shape of a trapezoid is holding back 13,936 pounds. It's withstanding 13,936 pounds of force. So that's, that's a lot of force. So, so if you think about a water in a window well, not as wide, not as deep, but still, still that's a lot of force on a glass, on a glass window pane inside a window line. So a couple of things on, um, on fluid pressure, fluid force that people often forget. One, you want to make sure that your height, your depth below the surface, the h sub y, you want to make sure that is positive. So however, however you set up your coordinate system, you need to set it up so that your distance below the surface is positive. <coughs> If your width varies as the depth changes, you have to express that width, what we call L sub y, you have to express that in terms of y. Your entire integrand has to be expressed in terms of y. And that's where the, the geometry, the challenge of the geometry usually comes in, is, is setting up that interval, finding, finding the width of your rectangle in terms of y. So questions on that example? Let me do one. Um, let me do one with a circle. So we'll do one example with a circle, and then I want to give you a little extension. Extension very similar to the theorem of Pappas. Okay, so we have a, for this example, we have a circular observation window on a ship. So a little, a little window in the side of a ship. Uh, the radius is one foot. The center is eight feet below the surface. <laughs> we want to find the force on this window. We're, we're underneath, we're underwater. We want to find the force on this window. So let's draw our picture. So here's my window not going to be to scale here. Where, is, where, Because we're talking about a circle here, where is going to be the easiest place to put the origin? At the center of the circle. If we put the origin somewhere else, then we have, we have shifted, a shifted circle and our, our equations get more complicated. So here's my, here are my axes, y, 
and x. We don't have to put them this way. It just seems like it's going to be easier. So the center is 0, 0. Um, I'm going to draw a little rectangle here. So we, for fluid pressure, fluid force, we always draw our rectangles horizontal because we're assuming that the delta y is so small that we're at a constant depth here. So this is dy. And the surface of the water is up here at y equals 8. So this is going to be h sub y. And y here is just from the x-axis up to there. So what is, what is h sub y going to be in this case? Someone said it. 8 minus y. So if we're at y equals 2, for example, we would be 6 feet, 8 minus 2, we'd be 6 feet below the surface of the water. If you're not sure, double check yourself that way. See how you've set up your coordinate system and say, okay, and now I'm at, at y equals 2, <coughs> and that tells me I'm 6 feet below the water, positive 6 feet below the water. So we're, we're good with the way we set up x sub y. Well, now we need to find an expression for L sub y for the horizontal length of that rectangle. Well, if we call this x, so we, we already said h sub y is 8 minus y, and L sub y, in terms of the variables I have there, L sub y is just going to be 2x. We've got to get x in terms of y here. Well, what's the equation of this circle? E equation, equation of the circle, not the area. What's R equals 1. So, how, what's the equation of the circle? <coughs> Center at the origin, radius, radius 1. There we go, x squared plus y squared equals 1. So now we can write x in terms of y. So x equals... square root of 1 minus y squared. So L sub y gets us 2 times 1 minus y squared. Well, I'm already I'm a little nervous about this integral because of the square root of 1 minus y squared. And we're going to say we're in the sea, so uh, sea water is 64 pounds per, per cubic feet because of all the salt dissolving. So the other the other example we were talking about fresh water. So this is seawater, a little, a little more dense. So now we can set up our integral. The force is going to be the integral. And I'm going to multiply by my density out here. What are the limits of the integration? So we're finding the force on the circle. So we're just integrating over the coordinates, the y coordinates of the circle. Negative of the one to one. Negative one to one, there we go. And then we have our integrand, h sub y is eight minus y, and our l sub y, our horizontal uh, length is two times the square root of one minus y squared. Oh, that's not too bad, is it? Because I have a y and a y squared. So that tells me, for that integral at least, we're going to end up with two integrals. For that integral it won't be too bad. So I'm going to separate this into two integrals because I have, I, I need to distribute here. So my force 
is going to be, uh, let's see, what do I get? 64, for this one I, 2 times 8, so 64 times 16 times the integral from minus 1 to 1 of square root of 1 minus y squared dy. So I'm distributing this to the 8 and the 2 to the 8 there for that integral. And I have minus 64 times 2 times the integral of minus 1 to 1 of y times the square root of 1 minus y squared dy. Alright, so we could do these integrals. We could evaluate them, but let's be smart about this. Let's look at this first integral. We're integrating <coughs> from negative 1 to 1 of the square root of 1 minus y squared. So if we look at our integral, what we're integrating is for y, for y equals negative 1 to 1 of 1 minus y squared. What, what is that integral telling us? That is the area of the circle. 1 minus y squared is the y coordinate of the circle. We're integrating that over the entire circle. This is the area of the circle. We could use trig substitution and we would come up with the area of the circle, but we, we could also recognize that this integrand, this entire integral is telling us the area of that circle. We're just integrating this function from y equals negative 1 to 1. That gives us the area of the circle. Just we're finding the area under the curve. And then let's, let's try to be smart about this one. We have y times <coughs> the square root of y squared and our limits are symmetrical about the origin. What's going to happen with that integral? This integral is odd and it's symmetrical about the origin so that is going to evaluate to <coughs> zero. an odd function and it's symmetric about the origin. This one not a, t not a hard one to, to evaluate but it will evaluate to zero. So our force is 64 times 16 times the area of the circle. With radius 1? What is it? Pi. Pi. So there's our, there's our force. And we, could, we would get the same results if we did trick sub on this integral and evaluate. Questions on that one? Okay, again, the important thing with fluid force, your depth is positive. You have to find the, the horizontal width of your rectangle in terms of y to integrate. Um, and you're integrating only over the, the region of the whatever the, the vertical surface is in the water. All right. Um, so I want to give you another little, um, another little extension. This one doesn't have a special name, so I'll just call it a theorem. Fluid force, F 
equals W times H bar times A. And this is on a vertically submerged plate. So let's talk about what these things are. W is the weight density of the liquid. H bar is the depth of the center of mass of the region. And A equals the area of the region. So if we have a, just a quick picture, here's my water, here's my region. <coughs> There's the center of mass. And this distance is H bar. So this is very similar to the theorem of Pappas. We're kind of assuming <coughs> that all of the area is concentrated at the center of mass. So we can find the center of mass of our region, multiply that by the area, and by its distance below the surface, we get the fluid force. Well, we just did that in the last problem exactly what we just did. We found that the fluid force was the weight density times the area of the region times its distance below the surface. So, another, another nice little, nice little extension. Um, and, let's see, I have some notes here. Problem number 23 asked you to derive this, this little formula. And then problem number 24 says to you is asking you to use this shortcut. So problem 23 is asking you to come up with this, and problem 24 is asking you to use it. Questions? Okay. Um, Um, trig substitution. Um, if you want to look back at trig substitution, remind yourself uh, about about some procedures. Um, the problems that I normally that we normally the normally assign are on page 539, number 15. Thirty-five, and I'll stop there. Those are just reminders of trig substitution. So, if you want to look back at section, um, and this is section eight point four. Uh, so, I'm not not assigning these. I'm just saying you, if you want a refresher or need a little refresher, you might try a few of these problems, setting these up and evaluating these intervals. All right.